friends are a good thing to have. Friends like Big Rat 310, who's on here all the time, because look, we have a get shtick, we have a gimmick going. Ironically, this is episode eight of Danny Dimes in prime time in association with episode number 251 of YWC Football Talk. But why do I say this so eloquent, eloquently and sophisticatedly? Well, because today, what aren't friends that you can't vent to or have a therapy session with? Because for everyone who's not living under a rock knows that Big Rat's team lost 28, uh, 48 to 20, and then my team got humbled 38 to 3. So Big Rat... How do we want to handle this? Ugh. Well, I'm happy to be back watching Danny Dimes probably lose in prime time. <laughs> uh, we the joke is Danny Dimes in prime time. The joke that we often don't say is that he's usually losing in prime time, almost always. Yes. Uh, so I'm happy to be back. I feel like I've been all over the show lately because they put all these prime time games early in the year. We have another Danny Dimes in primetime game next week, too. It's crazy. Uh, but I would say I agree with you. Friends need to vent. Friends, you need to be there for your friend when they're having a rough time. You can see the true measure of a friend in life is the guy that the guy or gal that is there for you when you're facing adversity. That's, yes. that's the person you need in your life. Not the person who's there when everything's easy. The person who's there when everything's hard. So it's a hard weekend for both of us. I think it's only fair if I let you vent first because the my result was shitty, but the long term outlook is still fine. Uh, whereas your day was even worse, and the long term outlook is a little murkier. So let's talk about that. So I say Murphy's Law a lot when it comes to the Patriots over the last three seasons because they've had a lot of games where everything that could go wrong went wrong. But this applies to both on the field and off the field because. Our star rookie cornerback now has a separated, not even a separated shoulder, but a torn labrum. And it looks like our star defensive edge, who everyone knows and listens to the show, knows that I love, looks like he's a torn bicep and is probably done for the year. So on top of all of that, well, it sucks, but I'll go to this. I've always been a Mac Jones supporter. I've always been in his corner. Yesterday was the first true time that made me sit down and think, is he really the guy? Is he the quarterback that can, you know, take the torch and go where this team and this franchise wants to go? I don't know. It was, it wasn't even the fumble. Like the fumble, that that was whatever. Those are simple mistakes you can correct. It was the crossbody throwing interception where you tried. It's like when you were a kid and you had an assignment to do and you waited till the last minute. So you basically were trying to scramble and put a bunch of shit together and you ended up getting a shitty grade. That's what the pick six was. Like even yesterday too, everyone was making the whole twenty-eight to three Dan Quinn stuff. I'm like, guys, this isn't the same. We basically now are finally getting the results of what happens when not only does the quarterback play bad, but the quarterback plays bad, plus the offensive line plays bad, plus the receivers can't get open. Ultimately, the worst game since I know everyone's gonna say Buffalo, but no, Buffalo was just unstoppable that night. This was the worst Patriots loss since the San Francisco game in 2020 when they lost 33 to three. Um the other thing I want to point out quickly, too, with this whole situation is I know everyone's saying right now, oh, you got to get rid of Mac. You got to do this. I'm like, what else is out there that's better? Like, I even said this yesterday after Bill's press conference. He said, Mac's our guy. He pulled him out. Why? Because he knew nothing good was going to come of it. Um, no one from the Bailey Zappi crowd was out because we all know Bailey Zappi's not going to come in and do what he did last year. Obviously, the timing's very similar, but we all know now who Bailey Zappi truly is as an NFL quarterback. Um Look, the pieces aren't there. We don't know what to do. It's They're in purgatory right now, which they're not good enough to contend, but they're not bad enough to tank. I also don't, unless you go into that Buffalo game at 1-5, and five, save, because they have two winnable games coming up. You have the Saints game, because the Saints didn't look too good against Tampa. And Vegas, we don't know what the hell to think about Vegas. Say, we're competitive. I'll give Aiden, Con all, Aiden O'Connell his flowers, because look, you took an ass whooping from Khalil Mack yesterday. But this team, there's still a roadmap to get there. I just feel like the more I do that, the more and more I'm going to end up setting myself up for disappointment when it comes to this football club. Just because it's like, look, they have, like I said, you have New Orleans, you have Vegas, but then you have Buffalo and Miami waiting for you, like the New York Giants. That's why this New York Giants game they're watching is a must win for the Giants. I don't care what you say. They can't go one and three going into the South, the South Florida Heat and into Orchard Park on a Sunday night, which is when Big Rad and I will be back on together next Sunday, uh, the 15th. Um, 
And then November comes around where they have the commanders, they have the Colts, they have the Giants, sure. But at the same time, too, it's the self-inflicted wounds now that make those games much, 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 much more must-win situations. If they had magically come and gone into, you know, two and two, say if they had pulled the rabbit out of their hat, because they did. I remember yesterday when they made the field goal to go 3-3, I was like, okay, cool. And then the CD Lamb touchdown happened, and I was like, drop in the bucket. You're not, you're not guard. It's one of those like unguardable situations. Um, so it's just, it's very unfortunate and it's very weird, but at the same time too, it's just <sighs> more than disappointing and more than sad. It was humbling. You know, when you like, when something feels like, you know, when your parents were yo- when you were younger and your parents would tell you, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. Yeah. And you like felt that that's how I feel right now as a Patriots fan. It's that disappointment feeling, not mad, not sad, just pure disappointment where it's like, fuck, this feels like rock bottom. Yeah. You know, I saw a stat, but that was the worst Mm -hmm. margin of victory in Belichick's career. And to the people listening, that includes the Cleveland Browns regime too. Like, at his whole life as a head coach, that was technically the worst loss of his career. I will say, obviously, this is an airing of grievances. We're mainly going to talk about our teams here. Yeah, uh, Like Dallas, it should be noted, Dallas is one of the best teams in the league. And Dallas does this to people. Dallas, it's like Dallas, Buffalo, and the Niners are like the only three teams that you can trust to just consistently destroy people. And yep. everyone listening out there, I'm intentionally not including the Chiefs and Eagles. The Chiefs and Eagles play a bunch of close games all the time. When they blow someone out, it's more the exception rather than the rule. Whereas Dallas, Buffalo, and San Francisco are the three teams that just consistently pound on teams. Especially- we're going to walk – we're going we're gonna to take your lunch money and we're going to eat your lunch too. And, and it spirals, too, because it's like against those three defenses, when you're down two touchdowns, and it's like, okay, we don't have to defend the run anymore. We're just defending the pass. Yep. And rather than, okay, it's garbage time, let's be lax, let's play soft on the back end and give up a bunch of big plays in the passing game, which is what would happen in a lot of Chiefs games where they'd be ahead by 14-21 and the other team would rally with two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. Against those three teams, that doesn't happen because – they don't quit the hustle to your point about taking your lunch money. They don't stop the effort. They keep the yeah. effort even when they're up several touchdowns. And now you just become a more one dimensional offense against an already super talented defense. So now you don't, you don't get garbage time. You just get, okay, a, a really good defense is defending your offense, except they know they don't have to defend the run game anymore. So now it's just easier to defend your offense. Like it's, it's, it's a cruel combination when you're facing those three teams specifically, but I, uh, so, yeah, it is important to keep in mind, like, it happened to Dallas. It's not like it happened to a random middling team in the NFL. It happened to yeah. one of the three teams in the league that does this. Um, exactly. That's the one thing I can take solace in is the fact that, look, this is a team that's done this in their three victories this year. Obviously, 40 to nothing against the Giants on prime time, 31 to 10 against the Jets, yeah. um, and then this yesterday. It's just. It, yeah, it does. It sucks, but it's just like that's the silver lining on all this. Um, also, say this: so will I get up and be excited to watch Pats football every week? Absolutely. Do I think this team can be competitive? Sure. They showed it against the Jets, even though they still there's an arguable case they should have lost that game. Yesterday was just humbling for the fact of like, look, you come back to reality strong and realize, yeah, you're not going anywhere this year. You're uh, you're probably going to be uh, down in the dumps. But I do agree what you said earlier, where mine's more of a reality check, while yours is a we can bounce back and we can be fine because I'm sorry, but when Daniel Jones is going to South Florida, heat check coming. Yeah, quite literally. Um, I feel like one of I, I've said it many times on the show that I feel like one of the betting angles that is most misunderstood in the NFL today that is not properly taken accounted for by most gambling experts. Yep. The Dolphins are one of the best home teams in the NFL. And they are 13 and two in two of his last 15 starts at home. They are a dominant home team. And because the narrative is, Oh, they don't have that many fans in the stands that people think that it's like an easy place to play. It is a very hard place to play. And it's not just because of the weather. Because, yes, the obviously the September and October heat 
makes it even harder, sure. But even in November and December, they're a very dominant home team in the Tua Tungavailoa era. And I feel like most people don't acknowledge that because there's been a lot of seasons where we've had backup quarterbacks the last few years or Ryan yeah. Patrick, and that has kind of like clouded the data. But if you just look at Tua's home starts, we are a lethal team at home with Tua starting and finishing the game. So, first week five start coming up too. Say it again? I saw this, this is going to be his first week five start at home, week five start in general in his career. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, because both the, his first year, his first year he was uh, – Week eight or nine against yeah, the LA? Yeah, it wasn't until the Rams game in week eight. He didn't play until then. And then the 2021 season, he broke his ribs in the second game of the year, which was week two, which was also the first home game. And yeah. then last year – he got the concussion on the Bengals game, which was week four. Um, yes. so it is miraculous he's still healthy at this point. But look, besides the point, on the Pats, though, I, I do think that, yes, the lack of offensive explosion is a problem. Yep. Yes, that, that does need to be addressed in the offseason. And, you know, it's it's possible that the defense, while it is good, you need it to be special in order to be like a playoff threat. And it is certainly good. It is certainly reliable and definitely against bad quarterbacks. I mean, it'll have a field day. Yeah. But it's not quite – it maybe doesn't have the same – especially with no Judon, and we'll see on Gonzalez, it maybe doesn't have the same type of game-breaking playmakers on defense that you see in the Cowboys' defense, that you see in the Niners' defense, that you see in the Eagles' defense even, that you see in the Bills' defense. Like, as good as it is, and it is good, it's not – awesome and it needs to be awesome to carry an offense yeah. limited explosion and so as a result what you're left with is you know it might be boring as a patriots fan but you're probably hoping to beat all the bad teams you know maybe beat the jets again when you play them again and beat all the other teams with middling quarterbacks on your schedule and then you just you basically hope that instead of eight and nine it's nine and eight yeah, it gets you a wild card spot, and then from there, you know, I, I feel like any playoff berth at this point should be viewed as a successful season. So, you know, like that 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 dream is still within reach. As people have said, they were they started one and three in twenty twenty one, right? And twenty twenty two. Yeah, so you know, and in twenty twenty one, they still won ten games. So, yep. Well, uh, awesome. my, my, own, my only thing is though is just that look. That's why I say the next two are must wins because look, there it's Derek Carr, but then last time two years ago the Saints beat the Patriots handedly. And then we all know what happened in Vegas last year. I don't think we need to go into detail. Ironically, you and I are recording again after that game. So hopefully it's a better ending this time than it was last. And then if they want to have each shot at the playoffs, you're going to hate me for saying this. They're going to have to steal one of Buffalo or Miami. They're either going to have to have Buffalo. They're going to have to split with Buffalo and probably hopefully try to escape Miami with a win, which is easier said than done. Then that's why I looked, that's why in my little soliloquy I looked at the, that November slate where it's like okay you're playing Sam Howell you're playing Anthony Richardson who's looked good but he is a rookie and we know Belichick loves to bully rookies and then you've got Daniel Jones at, at, right around American Thanksgiving so that's where if they can go three at, so say if they can get out of that Buffalo Miami stretch at four and four or three and five they win three straight six and five going into December is pretty much playing playoff football to where their December is fairly easy because not fairly easy, but there's some winnable games there because they do play Pittsburgh. They do play um, Denver, which I always like viewed Pittsburgh as a team that could be in it. But after yesterday, spoiling my parlay, they can go to hell. Um, I'm actually going to go off. I want to go off on that. Cause I'm going to go talk about that. Cause I'm done. I, the more I talk, I'll talk about that in a second, actually. But yeah, so that's the thing where I look at it, where I'm like, there's a roadmap still to nine and eight or 10 and seven, but everything has to fall right. And I feel like at the end of the day, I'm just going to, End up getting my heart ripped out when we get eliminated on New Year's Eve by the Buffalo Bills again, because for the third year in a row, Buffalo's probably going to knock us out of the playoff picture. Um, on to the parlay. So I don't know if you oh, – okay, go on. Oh, no, no, sorry. Oh, we can talk about – I'll, I'll, I'll have something to say on the Patriots, but we can go to the parlay first. Um, the Ravens, Titans. Yes. Right. Those two hit. Pittsburgh minus three. Yeah. I didn't realize that Tomlin's 8-20 and 20 as a road favorite. Yeah, he's – He's a tricky one because when he's at home against a contender, he's like awesome. But when he's on the road against a sub 500 team, even when even in the Big Ben days when they were like winning 10, 11, 12 games, they would usually struggle there. It's very straight. It's it would be classic Tomlin 
to lose to the Texans by 23 on the road or 24. To beat Baltimore at home. And beat Baltimore with a backup quarterback. It like would be the least surprising thing in the world. Um, so the, I want to explain the bets for you. I do write articles about them, but I basically did Tennessee was, look, it's our Mike Rabel rule. You don't bet. Who, who is a home underdog again this week against the Colts? <laughs> um, I, think and I, which, I think that game's in Indianapolis. I could be wrong, but I think so. I, I just saw there were, I think the Colts are like minus one and a half or minus two yeah, and a half. One minus two. one, minus one in Tennessee, I think. Yeah. I mean, see? Not, not, no, no, in, in Indianapolis, Indianapolis. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, the Colts, the, the Colts are at home. But, yeah, but yes, nonetheless, Vrabel yeah. underdog. Still, still Vrabel home underdog. We also have to talk about the Cincinnati Bengals during this podcast. Um, and then Baltimore at home, I viewed as a – Baltimore on the road, excuse me. I viewed that as a get-right game because I felt like they got hosed. I loved the Colts on the spread last week, the plus seven and a half against Baltimore. But the way that Baltimore lost and the fact they didn't play that well, I'm like – and, you know, Cleveland had such this great game and everything like that. And then you had the Njoku burns. And then you had the Deshaun, which is weird. He played with, like, we don't know if there were second or third degree burns. You had Deshaun Watson has a bit of a fucked up shoulder and he couldn't play it, which was very weird. And then they get cooked at home. I feel like Cleveland's going to be that team that they're either going to win or they're going to get their asses kicked. I feel like their losses are going to be bad. Uh, and then the logic behind Pittsburgh was, for as much as I loved Houston plus eight two weeks ago, I thought this was going to be a comeback to earth game. But we all know that the podcast, by the way, has a favorite wide receiver. CJ Stroud might be, but CJ Stroud might be coming the podcast's favorite quarterback. The kid is unfreaking believable. I I have uh, I believe I said this on the show before that I'm I'm part of a college football dynasty league where yes. the guys who draft on the college dynasty team go to your NFL team, and I've had Stroud on that team for a very 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 long time. I've always been a big fan. I was I had him on the team when he was at Ohio State before he officially was. Before he officially like like really dominated yeah. as the starting quarterback, there was like concerns would he keep the job? Because at the time his backups were Kyle McCord, who was a Quinn Ewers. Player. Yeah, and, and Kyle and Kyle McCord and Quinn Ewers. Quinn Ewers, starting quarterback at Texas. Kyle McCord is currently the starting quarterback for Ohio State. So it was a very intense quarterback room. And there was a lot of people in college football circles that wondered, eh, CJ Stroud even gonna keep the starting job. He's got a lot of competition behind him. And so I drafted him in the league back then. And he's been, you know, other he was otherworldly for us at Ohio State. And now he's on my NFL Dynasty football team, and he's doing awesome. Love Stroud. Love Stroud forever. Also, Nico Collins has got to be the best late-round pick in fantasy of anyone this year. He has been dominating. He had 35 points for me last week. Oof. I mean, I'm looking at fantasy now, and the one thing I need to happen for tonight for me is already gone down the drain. I need a DK to have a quiet night, gets the first touchdown. I've already lost. But, um, but no, it was just – I said this. I also wrote an article about the Lions because you know me all off season. I was kind of not doubting them, but I was I, I didn't want to believe it just because this happens every year. You know, there's a team that kind of comes in. Everyone's got hype for. Yep. Dan Campbell's. They proved me wrong. They they looked fantastic. My, Lions minus two free money. Which I'll say this. I didn't post a video about it, but yesterday Calvin Ridley plus Jags money line plus Jags and survival. So I had a good nine thirty window. And I did watch the Toy Story feed by the way, which was awesome. Oh, yes. I'll say this. They had some weird technical difficulties, but at the end of the day, it was a lot of fun. It is a great marketing tool for the NFL to use to where it's like, hey, get your kids to watch this. And I'm sorry, but showing Chad Muma getting his soul taken from him and his ankle snatched as a Toy Story character, not not fun, not fun. Um, but no, and so where I was going with the Detroit angle is I feel like Houston's doing the exact same thing. You've got a coach there that can build a culture. You've got a quarterback. You've got a running back in Pierce. Their tight ends aren't too bad. Dalton Schultz had a touchdown yesterday. Um, Brevin Jordan from your U, from Miami, pretty solid. And then you have Nico Collins. You have Tank Dell, Devin Singletary. Plus, you got Will Anderson on the other side of the ball. If Kenyon Green can mold into something, like, and plus Laramie Tunsil. Like, they're that team to where it's like, hey, you keep at it. Like, this year, they're, pro they're probably going to suffer a bad loss. We'll see when it is. And they'll probably go on, like, a four- or five-game losing streak. But... Houston's that one team that you can look at to like two, three years down the road to be like, they can be a force in the NFL. Yeah, no. And I had, I had my brother ask me today, like, can they even win the division this year? And I'm like, I mean, I wouldn't bet on that. Uh, no. But fuck, I mean, they've, they've played really well. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, they've they dominated Jacksonville. Um, it's, it's really fun that Stroud and Richardson are both in the same division. Yeah. 
they're going to play each other twice every year. And that's going to be like a little mini NFL rivalry, like watching those teams go against each other. So yeah, no, I mean, definitely agree. Houston, I think most people were optimistic for the long-term future of D'Amico Ryans, but it was just yes. a question of how fast are we going to see it? Like, I think on our previous show, like Greg pointed out that D'Amico is building something real. And I think me and him both kind of agreed that this is going to be a really good foundation, but not yet, not in 2023. And fuck, in 2023, they're playing really well. They're two and two. I, they're, I personally think the Falcons are going to bounce back this weekend and beat them in Atlanta. But I know a lot of gamblers that are like slamming the Texans on the road this week. Like there's a lot of faith in what the Texans are building. So it'll be interesting to see how the story plays out. The um, weird way the NFL works is I can see them having – this is their letdown game, especially considering there's all these question marks surrounding Desmond Ritter. And I feel – and Kyle Kyle Pitts going out there for a jog, to which I saw someone say, oh, do we want uh, Brock, like Arthur Smith commenting on Brock Bowers? I'm saying, no, don't do that. Like, let Brock go somewhere where he's going to be good. And I'll say this as well. For anyone out there right now with Brock Bowers saying, yeah, I think he's going to be a great tight end. You got to give it time. He's not going to come in next year and light the world on fire. He may, but look at between the last few years, the best rookie tight end so far has been Sam Laporta. Like yeah. we were like, like uh, we were saying, Iowa's Iowa pretty much runs a college system up there with its a uh, football a pro system with its college tight ends. Um, but I will say this about Houston going back in time. I know you guys are getting clowned on for the me for the emoji shirt, but I will still say this: the worst fashion statement in a game to still lose will always be the 2012 Houston Texans yep. in those var. I'm sorry, when you wear varsity Letterman jackets like that and then get schooled on Monday Night Football on on the road too, it's not even like it was in that building. Yeah, exa- exactly. So that's it. Um, so one thing, can I say something quickly before I let you speak? Go for it. Go for it. With your team. I don't view like I, I feel like we were right. Everyone was way too early to count Buffalo out, and their fans until last night when man they found some fucking receipts on some of your fans. They found they did some they did some bookmarking Bills Mafia. Um, you and I were right in the sense of look, the one game means shit. The fact that they've gone out there and scored 38, 37, and forty eight. Mm-hmm. This is a dangerous fucking team. Yeah, they can even win with the- losing Trey White. Even with losing Trey White. Yeah, they can win the Super Bowl. Um, I think that's pretty clear. I think one thing we also talked about on the show was there was a lot of people kind of like hypothesizing that maybe the Bills could take a step back in the AFC when in reality it was the Bengals that actually could have taken a step back. And because the Bengals beat the Bills, I felt like people weren't willing to accept that. But the Bengals. And granted, Burrow got hurt, so it's not a fair comparison. But still, plus still. the Bills, the Bills were mentally worn out by the time they got to that divisional game. Because like, look how you have everything with Hamlin. You had then New England that you scathed by. They still won by twelve, but there was a close game until the second return. Your game, where Skylar Thompson almost beat them, and then Joe Burrow just went in there and showed out. Because that's the last time Joe Burrow's looked legitimately good. I know they won last week, but they still did not weren't overly impressive it was just more of which team can play better than the other that's what that's what last monday's game was so for cincinnati it's do we start talking about a zach taylor hot seat soon or do we give it a couple more games not yet not yet yet. yeah Uh, they've had too much playoff success the last two years i think fair um especially since he hasn't built an excuse could he is he doing the best he can given burrow's health no probably not but nonetheless there's there's time on that front. But on the on the fence, um, I guess my airing of grievances. I mean, yeah, I was disappointed. Can I say I, one more thing, actually? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to be a nice guy. You might hate me for this. I'm going to give you the entire screen. <laughs> oh, my God. I feel like we're playing uh, whatever that damn game was, uh, Around the Horn. And I'm getting my FaceTime segment at the end. Uh, basically, instead of ranting about the Dolphins, I should just give you guys, like, a nice like propaganda piece about some charity I'm supporting or something like that, but fine. We'll stick to the fins. So disappointing game, very disappointing game. Uh, I'm not surprised necessarily. Like I always knew that result was in the range of outcomes. Uh, but you know, the line was only three, two and a half. I was hoping, okay, if you're going to lose, lose like they did last time where the two games, the two games that they had, 
were very, very close with the with the um, Bills last year in Buffalo. Both those games were very close, but we still lost. And I was thinking, okay, maybe they'll lose close again. You know, hopefully that like hopefully that's the worst that can happen. That they'll just lose close again. And unfortunately, they lost again, but they got destroyed this time. It felt like they took a step back from the progress they made last year by making every Buffalo game close, and they kind of went backwards on it. So the problem is the defense. Uh, I am disappointed with how the defense has played this year. I've been very disappointed as a fan. I don't like when Benjamin Solak and Mina Kimes and all these analysts on Twitter are always talking about all the talented players in the Dolphins' defense. It's like it can't be true that all of those guys are that good and this defense is this bad. Like, I feel like we as a fan base, as an NFL community, maybe we're overrating some of these guys. Because it cannot be true that Bradley Chubb is a $100 million edge rusher. Christian Wilkins wants $20 million a year. Zach Sealer, they already gave like a $12 million extension to. Jalen Phillips was a first-round pick who most people in the Dolphins and NFL community writ large is very high on. He didn't play yesterday, it should be noted. But nonetheless, everyone's very high on those people. That also throw in... Jerome Baker at linebacker making $13 million a year. David Long, who only makes $5 million, but the NFL community loves David Long. Let me tell you guys, David Long's been very disappointing this year. With the exception of, like, some plays he made in the Patriots game, like, he's generally struggled the other three games. And this is the guy that, like, Doug Farrar and all those people are talking about how much of a clear fit he is in the Fangio defense. Xavier Howard makes $25 million a year. Jalen Ramsey makes a lot of money, but he's on IR. Javon Holland at safety, people think is the best safety in football. How can seven of the 11 defensive starters be really good players and the defense fucking sucks? This doesn't make any sense. Like, I'm tired of it. I'm so tired of everyone telling me how much talent is on this defense and them playing this bad. And they specifically get their asses beaten when they face Buffalo. Every single time. Josh Allen looks so different against us than he does against the rest of the NFL. And it's not a comment on him specifically because he is a great player. But he is at his peak against the Dolphins. Whereas the Jets, a worse team in, a, in our same division, find a way to make Allen look bad every time they play him. We can't even make him look average. We can't even make him look a little bit above average. We have to make him look like the MVP frontrunner every single time. It's so frustrating. So. Me, personally, as a fan, I can handle, okay, maybe the GM overpaid <clears throat> Bradley Chubb. A lot of people were high on him. The Dolphins weren't the only team that wanted him, but fine. What I cannot handle is Christian Wilkins sitting out the last two weeks of training camp, not accepting the Dolphins' extension offer of like $14, $15 million a year because he views himself as a $20 million a year player, and then he plays like this. With big money comes big responsibility. If he values himself at that level – we better see better production because right now the move is to either let Christian walk or give him a lower offer with the way he's played through the first four weeks. So the defense is the story. They gave up 48 points, two injuries that I do think matter for the next time we play Buffalo. They didn't have Jalen Phillips. Like I said, Greg Bedard from the Boston sports journal. said Jalen Phillips is our best pass rusher so far this year. It's been Andrew Van Ginkle, but fine. I'll give Phillips that benefit of the doubt when he comes back. Another injury that I don't think most people know about is Deshaun Elliott. And that was the thing I was talking about in this tweet I sent out earlier today, um, citing Griff and citing other members of the podcast. When the Dolphins were under Brian Flores and Josh Boyer, they would have Javon Holland play as the deep center fielder, and they would blitz with Brandon Jones a lot. Or Brandon Jones would be in the box, be a linebacker type, maybe give like a brutal hit in the run game. That was usually Brandon Jones' role. While Javon Holland was a deep center fielder, sometimes they'll do a cover zero blitz and they'll blitz with both of them. Brandon Jones, phenomenal blitzer. Phenomenal. Definitely fits very well in the Brian Flores scheme. The problem is this is a different scheme. And in this scheme, they play with two deep safeties a lot, which means Brandon Jones is primarily in coverage the whole time. Or, and I don't know why they're doing this, Vic Bongio has actually flipped their roles. He has actually put Javon Holland in the box more often and given Javon Holland more of a slot corner slot responsibility more often. As a result, the other safety is actually playing the deep center fielder, not Javon. But that was Deshaun Elliott. And that's why Deshaun Elliott kind of beat Brandon Jones for the starting job. But when Deshaun Elliott misses yesterday's game, you would think, okay, let's just flip Brandon Jones and Javon Holland back to the roles they had in the other defense because that's what they know. 
And instead, they kept Javon Holland in the role he's had this year, and they asked Brandon Jones to be a deep center fielder, and he's not capable of doing that. There was a play where Cater Kohu got beat by Stephon Diggs, and Brandon Jones tackled Cater Kohu. He tackled the Dolphins defender, and it resulted in Stephon Diggs getting a wide-open 50-yard touchdown. It's that play where Diggs gets a catch, breaks two tackles, takes it to the house. That was directly attributable to Brandon Jones playing, playing out of position, and not the guy that should be in that spot in Deshaun Elliott. I like Brandon Jones. I think he's a great player. I just don't think he fits this defense. And I think when Deshaun Elliott doesn't play, it's a huge drop-off for that reason because you're dropping off to a player who doesn't know the defense the same way and doesn't play at the same level that you need from the other guy that's starting. So it's uh, concerning, unfortunately, that the defense played the way it did. But I do think there's reason for hope for those two injuries with Jalen Phillips and Javon and uh, Deshaun Elliott coming back in the rematch. But I'm also not an idiot. I also know that the Bills didn't have Von Miller. The Bills didn't have Jordan Poyer. Maybe Jalen Phillips and Deshaun Elliott play in the rematch, but two other guys don't play. So you can't just rely on that. Jalen Ramsey would make a big, big difference. The Dolphins didn't have a corner they trusted to cover Stephon Diggs yesterday. They don't trust Xavier Howard on him anymore because Stephon Diggs has beat the shit out of Xavier Howard over the last several years. So they put Cater Kohu on him instead. And a lot of the fan base got like really, really mad at this, but the logic to me actually made a lot of sense. Cater Kohu, Cater Kohu is a better like slot corner than Xavier Howard is. Cater Kohu is also a higher rated corner in PFF this year. There's 101 cornerbacks graded by PFF. Xavier Howard is 95th out of 101. 95 out of 101, Xavier Howard. Cater Kohu was 14th out of 101. So the thought process of putting Cater on him, I thought was reasonable. But the problem is Stefan Diggs owned him. He's smaller to begin with, so generally not good enough to play in that spot. So what you're left with is Cater Kohu kind of playing out of position and not having another corner that you trusted instead. The move is probably to just double team him. Like, don't trust any one quarterback, cornerback to cover Stefan Diggs. Just double team him instead. But unfortunately, they didn't have that option. And hopefully for the next game, the option is Jalen Ramsey. Not that I think Jalen Ramsey will shut him down, but I certainly think holding him to 65 receiving yards would be a massive upgrade over what they're doing right now with Stefan Diggs. So I do think the Jalen Ramsey injury is significant. So case in point, that injury I think matters. I think the rematch shouldn't be this bad. Ideally, with Jalen Phillips, Deshaun Elliott, and Jalen Ramsey, the rematch will be better. But that's not going to be enough to bridge the gap because he lost by 28 points because they didn't have Jordan Poyer and Von Miller themselves. And who knows what injuries manifest on both sides of the ball by the time we get to December. The defense has got to start playing better. Vic Fangio is a great defensive coordinator, and I understand that there is a scheme transition. I made that argument on this podcast. This defense is being overrated. They're not going to be that good right away because it's a huge philosophical shift in the defensive structure. That's totally fine. What's I expected it to be better than this, though. I knew there'd be a transition, but I ended that point on the podcast by saying maybe by the end of the year, they'll be fringe top 10. They're not close to that right now. They have time, but we got to see it now. This week, they play the Giants. Next week, they play the Panthers. Both games at home. Both games in Miami Heat. Now. I don't care if the offense only scores two touchdowns the next two weeks. I don't care. They've proven enough to start the season. I need to see the defense destroy some teams immediately. Because if they don't, this team is not going to go to the Super Bowl. They're not going to make a Super Bowl run. They'll be lucky to make the playoffs, maybe beat the AFC South winner in the wild card round, have their first playoff win in 25 years. It'd be a great accomplishment. But the bigger dreams that we had, they're not going to happen if the defense plays like this. And if it doesn't happen, they got to stop. All those guys on defense, you're going to have to let some of them go. You're going to have to cut Jerome Baker. You're going to have to cut Emmanuel Ogba. You're going to have to not resign Christian Wilkins. And when I say this to the Dolphin fans, they're like, no, 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 but all those players are good. They can't all be good and all worth this money. They just can't. It mathematically does not make sense to pay seven defensive starters over $10 million, and your defense sucks. Like, what logic is that? I don't care if they're individually good in a vacuum. They don't play well together. At least they're not right now. All I'll say on the offense is, yeah, the offensive line struggled once Armstead went out. Yes, Tua in the second half had a bad interception and should have been picked off earlier in the game too. It was definitely Tua's worst game of the season of the four he's played. But they still scored 20 points. 
They had a touchdown of J- Jalen Waddle that was called back because Liam Eikenberg was an ineligible man downfield. Liam Eikenberg is not the starter. He's only the backup because Connor Williams was out this week, which was a huge loss. Connor Williams resulted in the Bills getting a lot of interior pressure. Of all the research I did before the game, they made it clear that Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver from Buffalo have been feasting interior for Buffalo this year. So not having Connor Williams at center made a big difference. Liam Eikenberg got beat often throughout the game, allowed a lot of interior pressure. But then on top of that, Liam Eikenberg got a penalty that took a Dolphins touchdown off the board. On a drive, they scored zero points on because they went forward on fourth down. If the defense wasn't so bad, let's say they were only down 35 to 20. Maybe the Dolphins kick a field goal on that drive, and they scored 23 points instead of 20. Same with the last drive of the game where they went forward on like fourth and 15 because they were down four touchdowns. So I think the offense, it had 400 total yards. 393 was the official number, but you get the point. They had 400 yards. Tua statistically, his day was fine aside from the interception. They had two drives where they scored zero points where if the game was closer, they would have had three points each. The offense probably should have scored 26, 27 points. The offense was fine. Like, yes, they had bad plays. Sure. But overall, the offense was fine. I don't understand how a lot of Twitter today, you're seeing a lot of people talk about how Sean McDermott broke the Dolphins' offense. The Dolphins' offense played pretty well. You could argue the Patriots held their defense down better than the, than the Bills did in this game. The Dolphins scored on their first two drives, touchdown, touchdown, back-to-back. I'm stunned that that was a popular point of conversation amongst people, how the Dolphins' offense got shut down. They scored three touchdowns. In the first half and the first drive of the third quarter, they scored three touchdowns. Like, they only didn't score more because they kept going for it on fourth down because they were down by so much. The Dolphins' offense was fine. Like, yeah, Buffalo's defense made some great plays. The offense made some pretty good plays, too. Like, I'm sorry. It's just wrong to think the Dolphins' offense got shut down. Why? Because they didn't score 70? Like, they they should have scored 26. Like, I, I, I don't understand this talking point. Is 26 enough to win on the road in Buffalo? Maybe not, but it's not a bad day either. Like, if the defense played better, it would have at least been closer, you know? But who's to say? I I do think the offense, sure, without Armstead, is the offensive line going to start to be a little leaky? Maybe. Um, I think they'll be okay if Connor Williams comes back. But if Connor Williams and Armstead both miss the next two weeks, then the offense, I think, will start to score less. I think you'll see more field goal drives instead of touchdown drives, and the offense won't be as efficient. But that Bills defense is awesome. Scoring 20 points, what should have been 26 points, it's not like you sucked. You did just fine. So the defense is the main source of anger. They need to start playing better immediately. And Jalen Ramsey, he's going to fix a lot, but he's not coming back for a while. So can't just be looking for him to save the day when you got like six other games to go before he comes back, including one against the Chiefs and one against the Eagles. So shape up, take care of business at home against bad teams. This team should win 10, 11, 12 games. This team should make the playoffs, and they still have a chance to win the division because they have not yet lost to Zach Wilson. The Bills have lost to Zach Wilson. If we beat Buffalo in the rematch and don't lose to Zach Wilson, we'll be ahead of Buffalo in the standings at the end of the year. But that requires us to handle our business in New York, which is not a guarantee yet. So all hope isn't lost. I kind of got in rant mode a little bit more than I expected. Like, all hope isn't lost. It's a bad loss. They're going to be fine. Like, they can very easily overcome this with better play, and the schedule lightens up for them a little bit at various points of the season. So the big picture is fine, but my main anger is the big, big picture of believing you can make the Super Bowl. You cannot do that with the defense playing like they did yesterday. So, like, are the goals of the season to win a playoff game? Yes. But ideally, you want to win a playoff game and at least hypothesize that you have a shot in the next round. The defense doesn't play better. I can't make that hypothesis. Like, I can't with the performance they put on yesterday. So defense, start playing better. And that concludes my lovely soapbox from the Dolphins game. Did you guys miss me? I'm back. Big Red, you've been able to see me through this entire podcast, right? Uh, No, I have not. Oh, okay, because I can see me on the, the stream but not there. So if you guys, if I'm a black screen but you can hear me, I apologize. Just because I, I think something's going on with my uh, – restream I, I don't know it's a long story whatever um i agree with everything you said on your dolphins where it's offensively there's no concerns it's it's defense because in reality you guys have had like because like if you look at buffalo for example 
22 points is the most they've given up. The most you guys have given up is obviously the 48 yesterday, but then the 30, 17, and then the 20 to Denver, obviously. Because I know after last week, you and I was a holy shit. Like, we didn't know where this was going, which also, you're welcome, because I knew you guys would cover the six and a half. Um, I agree with everything you said in the sense, too, of where defense has really got to shape up. You got to take care of business against the teams that you're supposed to take care of business of. Like, for example, October 29th, when... uh, you and I go head to head again for the last, which feels weird. Last time, last time of the season, New England, Miami only play. It's done. Usually, we play you guys like December or January for sure. And um, I'm, ex- and I, I do like to say what you said earlier. I do agree that that home game is not a guarantee because division games are weird, and Patriots are very likely going to need the game. Division games are weird, so yeah. it'll probably be another twenty-four to twenty, twenty-four to seventeen, twenty-one to seventeen, twenty to seventeen. It'll probably be another one of those. Yeah. And like, cause even for the survival aspect of it, cause I remember half my league yesterday had the Eagles and they all had to sweat it out. And I remember my mom was telling me, Hey, I like the Eagles. And I told her, I'm like, that's a divisional game. I don't pick divisional games for survival. I want to take Detroit last week, but I didn't. Um, I do have, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but yeah, that's going back to you guys. It's more about, like you said, you just know you can't afford because if say if you guys, for some reason, obviously lost yesterday, with teams like New York and Carolina coming to town, teams you should take care of business of because New York, look, they're having a really big come to earth here. And then Carolina is just bad. Like that's like, I'm going to say this right now. I don't even see Carolina where there's like how you can improve drastically unless your quarterback becomes this like franchise altering guy, unless Bryce Young becomes like a top 10 quarterback in the league. Um, So the, you got to take care of business of there. But the big one was, I was trying to think of who do you play week seven, and then it clicked in my mind, you guys going to Philadelphia. Sunday night football. Football. Them and the Kelly Green. Days and dreams and nightmares. That's the next big litmus test for the Eagles. That's the game where it's like, hey, you got to go in there and you got to win that. Because like even with New York, I was saying come back to earth. Like If you look at their next few games, Dolphins, Bills, Commanders, Jets, this this is a this is a team staring one in six or seven right in the face. The next winnable game I see is the Raiders, just because I think the Raiders aren't that good of a team. Um, but when it comes to you guys, I don't think there's any room to panic for when it comes to short term of the season. Like I said, I think you guys will be in the playoffs. I feel like you guys are there. Week eighteen, that is going to be the test when they come into your house. Because there is a very likely chance that both you guys have something to play for. I don't think that's going to be a game where you rest your starters. No, I think that's a game where it's the AFC East could be on the line. That's a game where, hell, for Buffalo, for or even if you guys, if you guys keep up your stuff, first place in the AFC is on the line. There is there is a difference there between hey, do you host a playoff game? Do you go on the road for a playoff game? There is yeah. a very good chance that game week eighteen is Sunday night football. It has felt like in the last few years, the NFL has botched the big division games at the end of the season that could decide the division. Like last year, like especially for the power teams in a conference is what I mean, is is more so what I mean. So like an example of that last year, Chiefs Chargers, right? Two playoff teams, but both of their games were early in the season. One game was really early in the season and the other was like by mid season. Yeah. And then Cowboys Eagles, you know, the Cowboys Eagles, they had their two games like a few weeks before the end of the season. It feels like, Whenever two play- teams from the same division make the playoffs, we almost never get that game right for the last game of the year. And like Seattle, San Fran in 2019 with the Dre Greenlaw tackle at the goal line of uh, Jacob Hollister, that's probably the best example that I can remember. But in recent years, we've been missing out on that. So I think this year with Dolphins Bills, you know, I, I wouldn't shock me at all if the Dolphins are 11 and five going into the game, the Bills are 12 and four. And if the Dolphins win, both teams are 12 and 5, and the Dolphins win the division. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if that's where we're going. So we'll see. Dolphins got a lot of work to do, though, to get there. Absolutely. That's why, that's why I say, like, hey, if you guys can escape no, October with, let's say, 4 and 1, 5 and 1, 6 and, like, uh, let's see, 4, 5, 6, 6 and 2, or 5 and 3, I think you guys will be fine. If you guys escape six and two, I feel, or even seven and one, there's still the odd there. You guys win your next four in a row because look, 
for as good as I was hyping up the Philadelphia Eagles, they've looked very vulnerable this year, except for the game against against except for Tampa. Um, we were talking about them earlier, and before we have a couple notes um, of wrapping up the show, Cincinnati. Do you think they'll find the gas pedal, or do you think it's there's something more there where this is going to be a very ugly season if you're wearing black and orange? Do you think Cincinnati will have something? I, it's it's tough. I mean, the, the answer to the question is: Does the Burroughs calf heal at any point? Um, I do think him last week on a short week was maybe. Maybe that was a bigger deal than we realized that he, that he only had like six days to heal the calf before the Titans game. So maybe now getting a full week will help a little bit, make it a little bit easier. I do believe that it could marginally improve just because I think that if it doesn't improve at all, I don't think they would be doing this. I don't think they'd be, you know, losing games anyways. It's not like they're winning in spite of his injury lately. They've only done that once. I don't think they do this and then also risk a calamitous injury that takes them out for next year as well. I don't think they would be risking this unless they genuinely believe that the injury should improve with rest, with the time in between games. Hoping that, especially like by the bye week, that after the bye week he's okay. So I think it'll get better. I think they'll start winning games again. But the problem is like the Ravens are just gaining so much ground on them. Not only did the Ravens beat them in Cincinnati, Three and zero in division now, or two and zero, two and zero, and they play. And I mean, if they beat Pittsburgh this week, they'll have won all their division road games already. And the Bengals lost at Cleveland. The Ravens won at Cleveland, and the Ravens won in Cincinnati. So they're not just like they're really not two games ahead of them. They're like three games ahead of them because they will win any tiebreaker with overall record because of their division record. So. Really, they're three games ahead of the Bengals. And I think making up that difference with Cincinnati is going to be really tough. So I think if they get back on track, make the playoffs, let's have some fun this year. Sure. Can they win the AFC North? I'll say no. Don't think that's possible, given the deficit that they've created relative to Baltimore. I think they'll be that team that's in there that they'll either sneak their way in or they're going to just barely miss out. They're going to go on a bit. I feel like I was looking at their schedule. They have a chance to go on a run here, but then they have a buzzsaw in the middle of the season when they play at San Francisco and then they host Buffalo in which I know he just played for the first time yesterday and he's more of a second string guy, but that game's still going to have a lot of emotion behind it for very obvious reasons. That's going to be a very emotional week for the Buffalo Bills and their fans. Um, when I look at Cincinnati, I just think of – I don't know what to think with them. It's just – it's its this weird spot where it's like you've had the world handed to you and it feels like ever since Jermaine Pratt pushed Patrick Mahomes out of bounds, the season's kind of gone – or the direction of the team's kind of gone in a downward spiral. Meanwhile, like you're right, Baltimore is a team where it's like everyone wants to be like, oh, Lamar can't do this, Lamar can't do that. But then you snap your fingers and – Lamar's doing Lamar. They there's a reason they went into Cleveland yesterday and they whooped them. I think what was 27 to 3 or was it 28 to 3? It was one of the two. But all in all, it was just you gotta figure it out. But for them, like I would not even try to look at winning the division unless you can just go on a run and like go. Cause even now, your best case scenario for divisions two and four and two, but then you're counting on Baltimore losing a couple of these games here or there to teams that look. They beat Cincinnati in Cincinnati. They whoop Cleveland in Cleveland. There's a very good chance they beat the Steelers in Steeltown, which I'm going to say this right now because I feel like a lot of people forget about it until the game week comes around. One of the most underrated rivalries in the NFL. Like, that's a rivalry that goes beyond the field. I feel like there's very few of them. Because, like, if you look at our division and our rivalries, like, we don't hate – like, when you and I play, yeah, it's all ha-ha, rah-rah-rah, fun. But there's a lot of fans out there who legitimately hate fans of the other team. There's reasons why there's shirts in Pittsburgh that say, I want to buy a vowel, and the shirt says F blank CK the Ravens. So we'll see what happens, but I think I'm not going to bet it because they pissed me off too much last week, but I honestly could see a world where Mitch Trubisky beats the Baltimore Raider, Baltimore Ravens. It's just one of those weird, goofy things, and I'm, I'm going to end on that because 
before we go, um, looking ahead to the lines for this week, is there anything that stands out to you? Five. Yes, Fab Five, baby. So, Ooh. okay, admittedly, I don't like giving the full Fab Five on a Monday because I need to do my research with injuries. Like, obviously, last week, there were two games, not just one, two games where the starting quarterback was a surprise to most people. We thought Jameis Winston was going to play because we thought Derek Carr wouldn't be healthy in time. He ended yep. up being healthy in time. And then, obviously, Deshaun Watson and uh, Dorian Thompson-Robinson. So, I think I need – obviously, nothing's finalized – until the injuries are posted. But yep. nonetheless, the four games that I like, it's the same theme for all four of them. Four teams coming off a loss at home, needing to prove something to maybe save their season. One of them is your Patriots. Mm. Uh, your Patriots at minus one and a half against the Saints. I've not been a Saints guy. I was on the Bucks last week. I think the Saints have been a little overrated. I think because – of their roster and because of Derek Carr, I feel like most people just gave them when they predict them to the, the, the NFC South, it wasn't that much conviction. It was like, okay, these other teams all suck. So we'll give it to you. And yeah. I think the Bucks roster was being underrated. I think people were overrating how much Brady leaving would hurt them because uh, one, as we're kind of now seeing with Baker Mayfield. Yeah. Tampa Bay has some pretty fucking awesome receivers and Brady did not transform that passing game. That passing game was awesome. Before Brady got there, when they threw for 5,000 yards with Fitzpatrick and Jameis the previous two seasons, Brady just didn't turn the ball over like those guys did. No, no small thing, like props to him, but Baker is playing right now about as well as Brady did last year, if not better. Like, I'm not saying it'll sustain like this for 16 games, but up to now, Baker's been fine. He has not yeah. been the problem. And so the Saints, I know the Saints need the game, but Derek Carr is hurt. The Saints also struggle to score 20 points, which is really good for the Patriots because I saw like I saw Tom Curran's postgame rant where he basically said the Patriots really struggle to score more than three touchdowns in a yeah. game. So when you're facing a team that also struggles to score three touchdowns in a game and you're the home team, I'd like to say that bodes pretty well for you. I, and look, coming off the worst loss of Belichick's career at home, everyone trashing Mac Jones – I feel like this is a classic bounce back spot where it's like, look, this Patriots team is not as bad as you think it is. They barely lost to Philly. They barely lost to the Dolphins. Yesterday was rough, but they don't lose like that to every great team they play. They may lose to every great team they play, but they don't lose like that, 35 to 38 to 3 or whatever. No. But I like the Patriots to bounce back at home, needing the win over the Saints. I also like the Falcons over the Texans. I know the Texans are hot right now. Everyone loves Houston. Everyone hates Atlanta. They hate Desmond Ritter. Give up on the Falcons. The Falcons are trash. The Falcons are undefeated at home. They lost at Detroit and a London game. Two kind of understandable circumstances. It'll be a home game. The crowd will be with it. I think C.J. Stroud, I love him to death, but I don't know if he's going to play great every week. I think rookie quarterbacks eat their lumps. They have that game where they throw zero touchdowns and three interceptions, and – I'm not saying that's going to happen specifically this week. I'm just saying when you have a rookie quarterback, you have a lower floor. So it wouldn't surprise me if the Falcons, if they could just build a lead with the run game, they'll be fine. The Jaguars have a really good run defense. According to run defense DVOA, they're top 10. Shout out, Randy. The, yeah. Texans, the Texans do not have a great run defense. Last year, their run defense was like historically bad, like an all-time bad run defense last year. This year, it's not quite at that level. D'Amico has certainly upgraded them to where it is definitely, like, more respectable, I would say. But nonetheless, the Falcons, Bijan Robinson still had 136 overall yards last week. So he is still a threat as a running back. Even though the Falcons didn't play well overall as a team, their run game is still legit. And I think that I think that um, more people are going to understand this with time. And I think the Falcons have had a rough two weeks, but they're at home. They're against a team that everyone loves, but I think people are kind of overreacting to the way they beat Pittsburgh. They weren't even favorites in that game, and now they're they're now shorter favorites against Atlanta than they were at home to Pittsburgh, which I think is weird. Uh, so I'm going to take the Falcons to bounce back there. The Bengals. I like the Bengals to bounce back against the Cardinals. I know the Cardinals are covering the Sheens, and I know the Cardinals play tough and fight with everyone every week. I understand that, but the Bengals are only three-point favorites. We finally – we've adjusted. This is what markets do. Oh, the Cardinals are 10-point underdogs every week, and they keep covering. Okay, now they're only three-point underdogs. That doesn't mean they're going to cover three-point spreads. I think the Bengals need this game 
badly. It's a veteran team. It's a team with a lot of Super Bowl people who played in the Super Bowl, who played in the NFC title game last year. They're going to seize the moment, realize it's a must-win game. They can't go to one and four in the AFC. That could end their season. I think they have an inspired effort. I think this is the first week where the Cardinals look bad. I know they've looked good up to now. They've been very competitive against a really hard schedule. I think this week is when they finally start to look like the bad team people thought they would be, which doesn't mean anything for the rest of the season. I just think they're catching the Bengals at the wrong time. So I like the Bengals to bounce back on the road there. I like the Falcons to bounce back at home. I like the Patriots to bounce back at home. And our boy, Mike Tomlin, at home against the Ravens with a backup quarterback. Trubisky might be better than Kenny Pickett. It's at least debatable. So it being Trubisky doesn't scare me that much. The spread is four and a half. There's everyone out there. Follow Brandon Anderson from the Action Network on Twitter. He has a great stat about how like 90% of Steelers-Ravens games in the last 10 years are decided by three points or less. Like this is the matchup where like the difference between three and four on the spread is massive. All of their games are decided by a field goal, decided by two points. It's always super tight. So even if the Steelers lose this game, they can lose by three points very easily and cover the four and a half, four number, their language, they're getting with Trubisky. So Steelers, Patriots, Falcons, Bengals, bounce back. All four of them coming off losses, saving their seasons. All four of them. Let's go. I, I love it all. Um, the one thing I'm going to say with that Pittsburgh game is, too, because the spread right now is at five. I feel like that's just too high. I look at that number, and I'm like, something doesn't feel right. Another one that I look at where I'm like, something doesn't feel right is Denver being minus two and a half. Yes. The I, are good don't, I don't like that. I know Denver, because I look at Denver to do like what Houston, what I thought Houston was going to do yesterday, where, you know, it's, Oh, are the Broncos back? No, we just realized that the Bears, because the for the Bears, for as much drama as there's been, Justin Fields played really good yesterday. Yeah. It's just unfortunate that their defense is ass. That their defense is terrible. Um, so I look at that, and that's an early line I like. One I don't know how to feel is Detroit at minus nine against Carolina. I know Carolina's look bad, but I feel like do we trust Detroit with such a big number to cover against a team like Carolina where remember Carolina whooped Detroit last year very late in the season. I think it was like 44 to like 21 or something like that. So we'll see what happens there. And then, like I said, too, if I were to do a quick parlay, I would do Miami to win, New England to win, New York Jets to win, the boys bounce back one. I also have a hot take for you that it's been sitting, but I'm ready to fire it out. Go for it. I like Jacksonville this week. I don't know what it is. London, the the London advantage. Yeah. It's the being there all week. It's Buffalo. It, Cause I'm going to give them an example too. It's you guys, but a week ahead, look at it last week. You guys put up 70 on the Broncos. You were fucking speechless. I tried to get you on, but then things didn't work out. And then this week you guys kind of laid an egg and then it's, Hey, look at Buffalo. Now it's Buffalo where they've had three games in a row beating an opponent by 28. The numbers five and a half. Bill's Mafia is probably be very well represented in in London. We'll see. I wouldn't bet it, but I think that's a game that very well could be an upset of the week in Jacksonville beating the Buffalo Bills just because of that. The other bet I will say right now that I love, 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 give me San Francisco Dallas under 44 and a half. I think that's going to be a defensive battle football game. And also because look at how Dallas went from putting up 40 to putting up 31 against bad defense not not bad defenses but like a def- the, the, the Jets defense is very wonky the Giants defense is pretty mid and then Arizona's defense limited them to 16 points San Francisco's the best defense they're going to be facing this year I fully expect San Francisco whose opponents have by the way I'm going to look this up live because that's what we do have given up 16 12 23 and 7 that's one game over 20 points one game. And that was to the Rams who know them. Every other team's been held under 20 points. That game reeks like last year's playoff game. Remember it was 19 to 12. I see a very similar back and forth game because both defenses, I think, are going to come to play. It's just the big advantage is what is Micah Parsons' ankle situation like? Because that's a very underrated storyline from yesterday's Cowboys win was his ankle. But that's just what I look at early. I'll make my final decisions later. The other one, too, that I love is um, Philadelphia minus four in L.A. I know L.A. got a good win yesterday. Puka Nukua looked really good. I fully expect the Eagles bounce back here. Kind of like how they 
had the Colts game with Minnesota, and then they went to Tampa and had a complete game. I also fully expect Eagles Nation to be very well represented in the Los Angeles area. Last one I'll say right here, too. Green Bay at minus two and a half in a perfect bounce back spot next Monday night against Las Vegas. Because not only are they going to Vegas, that play that, that stadium is going to be green and yellow. Yeah, much like how when they played the rate when they played the Steelers, it was most Oh my green. god. Dude, that was a Steelers home game. <laughs> very similar. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a fun week. It's gonna be a very fun week, guys. Well, anyway, that's gonna wrap it up for us here. 251 of the books. We are marching to the next 250 to beat a 500 before we know it. But remember, guys, we got two episodes coming out this week. One's already been announced with John Hendricks from SaintsNewsOfSI.com coming on here Wednesday to preview Saints Patriots. Thursday night, Pat Lane, McGarvin, and I for a bit of a come to Jesus slash what went wrong or what can we do better Patriots podcast. And the man to my right, Big Rat 310, even though you haven't seen me all night long, we'll be back next Sunday night and before week eight. Why? Because Danny Downs in prime time, Pat's at Dolphins. But for Big Rat 310, I'm your boy, Griff. Thank you very much for listening to YWC Football Talk. You all have yourselves a very good night.